I was working in Los Angeles. I had a brand new studio. I had recently, well, recently, a year and a half before I had quit a job at the last job that I'd ever had working for somebody else. I put myself. And things were going very well. Uh, the economy had collapsed, but that meant that all the big studios, their clients were coming to me, the, the one-man operation. And I was specializing in sustainability and creating brand packages for companies and creating new companies for companies. So uh, things were going very, very well. I was living with my girlfriend in a nice two-story house on the west side of Los Angeles, right by the beach. And uh, yeah, I mean, things were going pretty fantastically. But we found ourselves in Seattle. And what had happened is that we had gone up to Vancouver because the presidential elections were coming up. And we decided that if McCain and Palin won, we were going to move to Canada. <laughs> uh, understandably, I think. <laughs> but the, the essence of the situation is that on the way back down, we came through Seattle. We ended up at this bar, kind of like this one, actually. It was kind of like a Latin fusion thing. There was some live music in the room. And she turns to me and she says, you know what, I, I think I want to move to Seattle. And I just kind of turn back to her and just reflexively blurt out, I think I want to leave the country. And we look at each other for a moment, and we both realize what just happened. Because when we first started going out about a year and a half before, we had each other that, you know, if we ever start to step on each other's toes, we're going to end this. We're going to stop before we start to hate each other for getting in each other's way. And, uh, you know, we're going to come out, we're going to come out friends, and we're going to come out with the be having the best relationship of our entire lives behind us, but, you know, still continuing our friendship. And that, that's, that's what happened. That night, that four months from that day, to give ourselves preparation time, to allow our friends time to adjust, uh, we would have a breakup party. And we would invite all of us over to our townhouse, and we'd have lots of alcohol, and we'd have tons of games, including a Texture X game with a, a prize going to the person with the funniest conversation with their ex, responding to the phrase, what are you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, basically, we, we ended up planning out our entire futures uh, that night and the following several days. What she wanted to do was what I was doing. She wanted to run a design and branding studio because she seemed she saw what I was up to, and she was running her own business at the time, and kind of the clientele had fallen off because of apps. Uh, and what I wanted to do though was travel. And part of the reason that I was working so hard and killing myself, working these like 100 to 120 hour weeks, was that I wanted to travel. I always wanted to travel. But I've been running these companies since I was 19. I started my first company, which was a magazine, when I was in college. And ever since that point. I could never leave. I was always in startup mode. My friends and family would go to France, and they'd be like, Colin, let's go to France. And I'm like, you know, I've got this advertiser meeting that I've got to do, and then I've got this. So I need to go do that. And that was the story of my life. And so I was saving and saving, and working and working, so I could make my first million dollars before I was 25, and then return to go travel the world. And that was the plan up until that night. And I, on that night, I essentially decided that I'm young, and then my there's no reason why I shouldn't be traveling now and doing what I'm doing while traveling now. So I formulated this plan, and when I got back to Los Angeles, I started a blog. I called it Exile Lifestyle. And social media is essentially what allowed me to take this silly little blog that I started as an excuse, you know, basically quit my life and start traveling. Uh, it, it allowed me to become kind of an influential force in certain areas on the internet. And it allowed me to do what I do now around, and I'm able to meet up with interesting people with a whole lot less effort than it usually takes. Uh, the three core components in my mind that allow me to take this project and really take off with it uh, are value, conversation, and branding. These are the three things that I focused on when I started up the blog and things that I focus on now and where most of my time for this project goes. Value is essentially giving before you get. It's creating something that will help people, that won't necessarily help you, but then it comes back like 10 times as much. And things uh, like even writing a blog is creating value. If you can write a good blog to somebody, if you can write a blog post, you know, 10 ways to use an iPhone better, you know, something, you might get a modicum of value out of that. Somebody will read it and they'll get more value out of their iPhone. So you've created something out of nothing. You've taken a little bit of effort and made a whole lot of something for somebody else. If you can write really good blog posts, something that's teaching, something that's about your life, something that other people won't get to experience necessarily, maybe in their entire lives. If they can live vicariously for you, for example, as you're traveling the world, and these are people who are stuck in an office, or people who are afraid to travel, or people who just don't think that it's very likely that they'll have enough money to travel, then learning what you're able to learn by traveling is something of value. 
And this is something that I discovered early on, just by existing and just by doing what I wanted to do and then telling people about it, I was creating value. And this came back 10 times over. People were very happy to hear about what I was up to. And by writing this blog, I got that value back. Uh, there are lots of other ways to create value, and lots of other ways that I focused on creating things like ebooks and then disseminating it through different social media channels. Uh, there's you know, sites like Issue, I S S U U.com, and Script, free PDFs. So I would write a book on something that I know. For example, Personal Branding was my first book that I wrote. It's about 50 pages, very small. It took me two months to put it together because I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but as soon as I put it out, my website jumped from maybe 500 visitors a month to over 8,000 visitors a month. Very quickly, within a few days of releasing this thing. And simply because I released it, I gave it away for free. I gave value, something that I knew a lot about branding, something that people need lots and lots of money to do. I was willing to give some of it away for free. And this is something that anybody can do, and so something that you can use to bring attention to whatever cause you happen to have by giving something before you ask for anything back. And at this point, I wasn't making any money off of Exile Lifestyle. I wasn't asking anything in return. I was just saying, hey, if you like this book, my blog. You know, I'm writing and stuff <laughs> over at the blog. Uh, and you can vote on where I'm going to, which is something I'll get to in a second. Uh, but giving away money is a key, key, key part of any social media strategy. And it's something that I preach to all of my branding clients. And people don't seem to get that you don't just go out and start saying, product, please come here and buy my product. Because that's the traditional way of advertising. But the new way of advertising, if you really want to get a loyal following, is to give something first and then say, well, if that, <laughs> wait and see what people pay for. You know, if That's what I'm willing to give away, just imagine. And then people will come to you. It's not interruption marketing anymore. It's drawing people in like you, you have this social gravity in a way. The next key component that I tried to focus on, and this was really important to me, was conversation. Uh, for a blogger especially, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I had run a few blogs before, but they were really piddly attempts. They didn't have very many followers. It was kind of just me to vent, almost like an old school open diary or live journal type of thing. Where I was like, yeah, today was not good. My boss sucks. Pretty much really mean blogging going on there. Uh, but I realized that as soon as I started doing something about it and drawing people in and getting these followers, and within six months, I think I had maybe 25,000 people coming in every month, unique visitors. And so that's a lot of people, especially you know, for a kid who didn't know what he was doing. So I wanted to interact with these people. I that all of the big name bloggers, all of the A-listers, that I would go to their websites, they would email me back if I said something to them. Or if I left a comment on their blog, they would be sure right away to get back and you know, thanks for coming. I really appreciate your comment. They may or may not have read it, but it made me feel excellent. So anybody who emailed me, I would immediately get back within 24 hours no matter what they had to say, if they were criticizing, if they were complimenting, if they were just saying, hey, like the blog, I'd say, hey, thanks, within 24 hours, because they're giving me that time, then I should give them that time back. And this tends to have a certain amount of pull within social media, because inherently it's something that's very easy for people. Everybody's on Facebook, everybody's on Twitter. It doesn't take much effort to just spout out stuff. But if you actually take the time to read what people are saying and to respond concerns to their questions, to anything that they have to say, then you're giving something extra. And that's something people value. That's something that people will tell their friends about. They'll say, yeah, this dude, I'm reading the blog. And I wrote him, and he wrote me back. And that might make somebody's day. I mean, and that's then you get word of mouth. And word of mouth is much more valuable than anything that you can get on the internet. That's real stuff. That's stuff that people pay good money for. So. Taking the time to start conversations and to follow up on conversations. The, the other end of that is that you go out into the work conversations. You ask questions. Uh, no matter what it is that you're talking about, why don't you expand that field? Why go off and write the same old blog post off and uh, you know, just answer the same questions that everybody else is answering? Why not ask things? Why not create <laughs> dissent? Why not uh, try to expand what you're working with them? If, if everybody accepts things one way, why not go off completely in the right field and zig when everybody else is zagging and say, well, why is it that way? It's accepted. And just by, even if you're wrong, even if it's clear why this is accepted, people will come and tell you, but at least you're creating conversation. You're stirring up debate. And by doing that, you're making your blog or your Facebook page or your Twitter profile, it's something that's valuable. It's something that people care about. It's some, some things are happening. It's not static anymore. It's, it's, uh, 
kind of an evolutionary cesspool, you know, kind of like where the original proteins of life came together. That went on on your social media platforms. And that's what you want to do. And the third point is branding. And this is something that I unfortunately had a whole lot of experience with, but I hadn't done as much with social media as I would have liked. It was all the visual components, it was the copy components, keeping a steady tone of voice throughout all of the different advertisements and put out that type of thing. But in social media, you have so much power to create a brand and to keep it consistent. And you have so much opportunity to completely just it without even trying to. And that's the thing that you really have to watch out for. On uh, social networks like Facebook, for example, you know, the, the same old story, if you put up your picture of yourself doing a cake stand, that's not really a thing here, I guess. And any local equivalent, what's like a cake stand? Something stupid you're doing, like university. Anybody? You don't, you don't something have cakes. <laughs> no, well, okay, just getting trashed off your face and then having pictures put up on Facebook. Not a great way to get a job. Not a great way to show that you're a reliable, trustworthy person who wants to repair somebody's tie, for example. Uh, you know, you want the stuff on your social media accounts to reflect the values that you uphold, uh, the tenets of what it is trying to uh, get other people to perceive about you. So if you say, you know, I'm, I'm some guy and I'm traveling the world and I'm doing it, I'm trying out a lot of experiment, I want to learn about the other people around the world that the United States uh, school system, for example, didn't teach me about because we weren't at war with them. Uh, and I'm basically trying to strip down out of my life all the things that don't matter so I can focus more on what I'm passionate about. And that's kind of more or less the basis of my brand. If I had and put up a bunch of photos of me, I don't know, <laughs> going off and just conspicuously consuming, buying three cars and then you know, going to, uh, just sticking around the United States instead of traveling around trying to learn, that would completely go against my brand message. That would be something that immediately told people, well, this guy's full of it. He might speak a good game, but he doesn't actually follow through with what he's saying. And that's incredibly easy to do. It's a big mistake that most people make, and it's because we don't have this barrier anymore. Our work life and our real life. We used to have kind of a schizophrenic personality. No matter who you were, if you were on Facebook and you worked in an office as well, you had office stuff, and you had real world stuff. And those might be two completely different people. You don't have that option anymore. These days, you have to have one person, and that means you have to be more honest with yourself. It means you have to be more honest with everybody else as well. And that's incredibly difficult because we don't spend much time thinking about what it is that we value. We don't spend much time thinking about what it is that we support. And that's the key component of any brand. I mean, you can say a brand is just a flashy website and a nice logo, but that's not it. I mean, the flashy website and the nice logo should come from what it is that you value. It should come from what it is that you believe in. Everything that you do in real life and on the internet should reflect who you are and convey to other people what it is you believe. It's an incredibly, incredibly difficult thing to do, and everybody messes it up, myself included, somebody who consults on branding to big companies. Uh, something to think about, and it's something that we finally, as individuals, without a huge budget to spend on social media, uh, can do for ourselves. Uh, social media equalizer. It's something that levels the playing field between the uh, proletariat and bourgeoisie, if you will. Uh, it's something that allows every individual to have the power of a corporation. Uh, there's actually an example that I want to give, and I'm really sincerely hoping that the Google page hasn't changed for this. But there's this club, a bar, in New Zealand called the Bangalore Polo Club. And Last year, on my 25th birthday, I had my party at the Bangalore Polo Club because it was this new fancy place in Christchurch, New Zealand that they had just spent millions of dollars renovating. And it was the coolest place in town. I had all of my business meetings. I really liked the people. I really loved the decor. The drinks were fantastic. Everything was great about it. And I had a big group of about 30 people come there for my birthday. And we were having a great and uh, a friend of mine, Tess, she was going to get her boyfriend, who was at another party. He was coming over, and she wanted to show him where this place was because it was relatively new that it had been renovated. She comes and they won't let her in. And uh, it turns out that they have a shoe policy where you have to be wearing a certain type of shoes to get in, uh, which is, I guess, understandable for a fancy place. But she had just been in there and she was wearing nice brown shoes. They weren't like leather, but they were nice enough. And her pants were kind of covering them anyway, so she couldn't understand why they wouldn't. And they let her boyfriend in, who was this kind of punk guy who had a shirt that said, fuck this, and you know, had his shirt tucked into his black jeans with the fold over biker boots. They let him in because he had leather shoes. So it seemed kind of like a double standard. She called me up and said, what's the deal? I'm stuck at the gate. I went out to talk to him and just said, guys, listen, I mean, 
she was in here before. You can't tell what she looked like anyway. What's the deal? It, it's my birthday. We're all going to be here and buying drinks all night. Just, you know, let it go. You know, it's, it's no big deal. And they said, no, nope, can't do it. And policy here. Very solid policy here. I'm sorry. I said, guys, come on. I mean, can I talk to the manager? I'm sure he'll understand. Seriously, we're going to be here all night. <laughs> yes, we are the only people in this club right now, and we're going to be buying drinks. If she can't come in, we're leaving. And just as a business decision, it makes sense. I'm sure, you know, if I can talk to him, no, nope. sorry, I can't do that. He's way too busy to pay attention to any kind of concern like this. Oh, okay, well, I guess we're leaving then. So we left. All 30 of us was empty after that. We went to another, their competitor right across the street and uh, had a wonderful time. We, we probably would have had a better time at Bangalore Polo Club, but they wouldn't let us. So the result of this is that I wrote a blog post about it. Because to me, it was just bad business practice to not give your subordinates, even if they're just the bouncer, the ability to come to the manager with a good business decision. I'm really hoping this is still here. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I wrote this called Dear Bangalore Polo Club. You screwed up. <laughs> still on the first page. After I wrote it, it was no search result for Bangalore Polo Club. <laughs> And the result of this was epic, because New Zealand, in a way, is a little bit like Iceland, in that it's, it's kind of a relatively small country, region-wise and area-wise, very concerned about what the rest of the world is saying about it, on the internet especially. So if somebody says something wrong, they are upset. And I wrote this thing, expecting an event for me, so that I didn't keep on bitching and moaning to my friends about this upsetting thing that had happened. But what ended up happening is that all of Christchurch was talking about it in the newspapers, and it was on the evening news, that this American who travels the world was in town, and he hates Bangalore Polo Club. He hates it. They had three investors <laughs> because sentiment was suddenly against Bangalore Polo Club. <laughs> and, it, I mean, it was this stupid little post. It, it wasn't even anything complicated. <laughs> See? Yeah, at the party. Uh, but everybody, my friends were calling me up. Colin, was that you? Were you the guy who wrote about Bangalore Polo Club? Everybody at work told me about it. Oh, my God, they're saying such bad things. This is the power of social media. I'm not saying that you should use it for revenge. I, just, I certainly didn't intend to use it for revenge. But it is possible. All of a sudden, this multi-million dollar venture, one blog post suddenly reduced their capital by half. The people that they had involved with it didn't be involved because one person suddenly had a voice. And that's the power that you have. The power, if you use social media correctly, if you manage your value conversations and brand correctly, then all of a sudden you're able to go into it. Social media is the most powerful, concise, and cheapest way to get the power of industry, power of a company inside an individual. So I said give it a shot. Thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, the, the follow-up to that is that they eventually didn't call me. They called my friend, who they went and gave her like a $300 voucher to try to get her to come back in. They didn't speak to me. I was there when she went in with a bunch of friends to spend the voucher. They wouldn't even look at me. So I guess they figured out who I was. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going next? I don't know yet. I just put up, actually, that's, that's one of the things that I do... Uh, that helped get attention, but it's also, the, the first part was that I'd never left the country before I started doing this, so I figured everybody knew better than I did. So I have people voting on where I should go next, uh, just with this little form here. So if you have an idea of where I should go, let me know. <laughs> right right now, India's in, um, but I'll, I'll have voting going until I leave Iceland, and then I guess I'll find out where I am headed for four months after that. So how, how long do you stay in this uh, I do four months in each country, and then in between I usually do little projects. So after I lived in Argentina, I trip around South America. After New Zealand, I did a road trip, a sponsored road trip, another power of social media thing. I got some sponsors. They paid for me to go party in 25 cities in the United States along a road trip in a month and a half with two other bloggers, which was really drunk. <laughs> I mean, it was mostly powered by alcohol and caffeine. Yeah, by the end, I was just like, oh my god, I can't. I'm so glad that's over. But it was long. Uh, I have one question. When you're promoting your blog, uh, what forms of uh, promotion do you like the most? I mean, are you always just, I mean, I see you're a lot in the press everywhere you go and you get a lot of attention. But I mean, are you also emphasizing a search engine optimization or are you doing what they always suggest that you go to all these uh, places where you can post articles and do the articles thing, link them back to your web? No, um, 
Because search engine optimization is important, but if you use the right software, like if you use open source stuff like WordPress, they have very good search engine optimization built in. As long as you add keywords to each post, then it'll be fine. That way you don't have to worry about the math behind it. You can worry about writing good content for people instead of robots. Because essentially, if you bring people in and the robots, they're not going to come back. But if you, if you bring people in and you're writing quality stuff, they're going to keep coming back. So the human component is super important. Um, don't go to content and submit your work to all these places that insist you pay for it. The best way to get track backs and link backs from high quality sites is to go around. When you first start out, start commenting on other people's blogs because then you're providing value to them by creating conversation about, around something that they've written. And then uh, post on Facebook and tweet. I know Twitter isn't super excellent, but Twitter is like the new Facebook in the United States, at least. People are kind of quitting Facebook and going to Twitter. Uh, but use both. And uh, repost it if you find it valuable. Show people. And then those authors will see it eventually. They'll see you. And then you can eventually contact them and do a guest post. And then that allows you to link back. Usually uh, the links in your name and the comments have a no-follow tag attached to it, so it won't... The search engines won't see that as like a track back. But if you're able to write a guest post, they'll be able to see your content in a much bigger blog, and then they'll be able to follow the link at the footer of that back to your, your blog. Uh, so that kind of stuff works really well. The other thing is just to create a stir. Start following people on Twitter, start talking to them, start conversations. Uh, do it in the comments, but also on social media. And then also start contacting uh, local. Because uh, it was actually, it was nice in Iceland that I had some people contacting me from the press ahead of time. But in other countries, like in Argentina, where I was just starting out, I contacted a few people, and then I realized that if I just contact the press with a press release, they don't read press releases anymore. So I had to contact an individual. So I started talking to a few people on Twitter that I, I searched for them. I searched for Argentine press or something like that. I, I found the local newspaper and searched for that as well. Found them, and then as individuals, I started talking to them, not letting them know that my hidden agenda was to paper. Uh, I just started talking to them about topics that they found important. And, uh, and that's nice, because if you can be curious and you can be interested and actually hold up a conversation about just about anything,